All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for, for coming out today, whether you're here in person or online with us. So today we're gonna have our, our fruit set meeting, talk about thinning at the 10 to 12 millimeter timing. I'm gonna give my rundown of what I've been seeing today as I've been traveling through the county. Then we're gonna hear from Dr. Robinson. And then after that, I'm gonna just go through a couple other odds and ends that I've been kind of kicking around in my head that I figured I'd talk about here in person today. Uh, before I do start, I do just want to thank our sponsor, Valent, for their continued support of our thinning series. We appreciate all the support that they've offered us through our various thinning meetings that we've had so far. Welcome, Zach. Hello. <laughs> all you missed were the intros. So to jump in. I was driving around today and just looking at the crop in, in different spots. And Jay, uh, once I go through, I'd love to hear what you've been seeing too, if, if you're willing not to put you on the spot. <laughs> but in general, um, you know, driving around, things things look pretty good. I'd, I'd say sets looking pretty nice throughout the county. I didn't see a ton of winter damage. Maybe in parts of the western side of the county, we can see little bits here and there in some varieties. It seems like the Burnt Hills area tends to be a little bit of a cold pocket. So we have some missing kings and some varieties like Honeycrisp and Gala, McCowns, where I've noticed a couple here and there. But for the most part, it looks like things are, are looking pretty good. Uh, pollination weather looked really nice. We had some really nice days. We always say when it's a, a quick bloom, things are going to set up pretty nicely. And for the most part, I'm, I'm seeing pretty nice fruit set out there at this point. There's a couple blocks that, you know, things are a little bit lighter, but, you know, if I had to kind of go off of an average, it, it looks like things are pretty good. Looking at varieties, uh, Honeycrisp, I thought looked pretty good today. There was some light bloom in some spots. Of course, we have some return bloom issues with Honeycrisp. So within the same block, you'll have trees that are on and off. Uh, nothing, nothing too out of the ordinary for us. Again, missing kings in a couple of the cold spots throughout the county, but there's still a lot of laterals that look like they're growing. So I think we still got a nice crop out there to, to do some thinning on. Gala also looking pretty strong like they, they tend to do. I think we need more thinning there. Again, I did see some missing kings in some cold areas, but the laterals are, are looking pretty strong. Max look good. Um, really the ones that I've looked at today, pretty much everything in the cluster is set up at this point. So I think we need some more thinning there. Fuji look pretty patchy. Again, being a variety that doesn't always return bloom, great tree to tree variation. Uh, Couple kings missing in there as well. They don't seem to be setting quite as, as well as some of the others. So maybe a, a slightly softer hand there, but there are definitely still some clusters, particularly near to the tops of the trees where things look pretty strong. Um, accounts, they look like they're setting pretty well. Again, some missing kings in spots, but overall I think we need some more thinning on them. I looked at one block of empire. They looked a little bit on the lighter side at this point. I think the petal fall thinner did a, a pretty good job in that block but I think they can still be cleaned up a little bit to space out the Kings a bit more. Cortland's that I looked at, good set. They definitely could use more thinning. The clusters still seem to be really strong laterals and, and good Kings on them. Then I also looked at some Snapdragon today as well. Of course, they bloom quite a bit later, so it's a little bit harder to tell with them. Most of the, the fruitlets on, on them are still about six millimeter. Uh, generally, I would say it looks like they had a really nice bloom on them, but the set looks to be a bit lighter or they might've just been hit by an earlier petal fall application. But I think still there, most clusters still have their kings, a lateral here and there. So uh, by and large, it looks to me like we're still gonna need to do some thinning during the 10 to 12 millimeter window. So with that setting the stage, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Robinson. And Terrence, I think you're still muted. I to unmute myself. Now we can share the screen. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, nice to be back to talk about thinning again. Uh, I want to just review that we hope that almost all orchards have received either a bloom spray or a bloom and a petal fall spray. And so today we're going to focus our thoughts on um, how well those two sprays worked and then how to decide how much to continue thinning and where to stop. 
So this moment in time, which we call the 10 to 13 millimeter spray, <clears throat> is when the plants and the fruits are most susceptible to chemical thinners. They're much less susceptible at petal fall and even less susceptible at bloom. Also, when you move forward and fruits get bigger than 18 or 19 millimeters, they lose susceptibility to the thinners. So this really is the key moment when you've got to be careful not to over thin, but you also have to be brave enough to thin as needed. <clears throat> and that's really what we're gonna to try to address today. So far I, in the season, I think it's exactly the way Kevin, has, or not Kevin, Mike has uh, talked about it. I wanna just review a couple of things. Generally in the capital region, we had warm weather during bloom <clears throat> that resulted in a relatively short bloom, but good bee flight and really good set. We didn't see a tremendous amount of winter damage. So in general, I think we could assume that we started out with a really good crop. <clears throat> Secondly, the bloom thinners that went on, and not everybody did this, but those that did, that, those sprays were applied under relatively warm conditions. Now, whether you sprayed ATS and tried to time those with the pollen tube growth model, or you sprayed NAA, we still expect relatively good response from those sprays applied during bloom. In addition, we talked earlier in a previous meeting about the petal fall spray, and it also was applied under relatively warm conditions with a decent carbohydrate deficit. It's at this timing of petal fall when fruits are about five millimeters, six millimeters, that carbohydrate balance starts to be an important consideration on whether you get thinning. And so the carbohydrate deficit we had during the petal fall window should give us pretty good thinning. And I had hoped that we would have most of the thinning done with those bloom and petal fall sprays. Now, as we look at where we're at today and then moving forward, the 10 to 13 millimeter spray, unfortunately for me, is going to go on under cooler conditions, not terrible conditions, temperatures in the mid 70s, but it's going to be not warm enough to create big deficits. So it's going to go on under relatively positive carbohydrate surplus. That gives only moderate thinning. And that's going to require basically to use full rates. <clears throat> now we've been suggesting now for a number of years to time this spray, the 10 to 13 millimeter spray, using degree days. And in the carbohydrate model on NUA, we have a column for degree days since bloom. And we'd like to try to hit the window between 200 and 250 degree days after full bloom. Now I got from Kevin a full bloom date for Clifton Park and I ran it through the carbohydrate model. Now he had given me the full bloom date of May 11th. Now I wanna emphasize that that date is not first bloom or when all the kings are open, that's full bloom. When 80% of all the flowers, including all the laterals are open. So it might be a little later than when you thought or you kind of assumed full bloom was. The graph in the top shows the carbohydrate balance, showing that previous to full bloom, basically from green tip on, the balance is negative below zero. There was a couple of days where it's just cracked zero. But during the bloom period, we had a substantial negative deficit period with the average seven day average reaching 30 minus 32. The deficit moderated a little bit, but as we went into the petal fall window, heat again returned. And so we had most of the petal fall thinning window from May 17th up through May 20th in a deficit period. Now, since then, the deficits have moderated since the heat on Sunday. And now we've gone to a positive uh, carbohydrate surplus. If you look at the table in the bottom, <clears throat> it can help us understand a little bit better the temperatures and the carbohydrate deficit. I'm gonna to start today, which is May 24th. It's predicted to have a high of only 71, a low of 50, really good sunshine. So it's gonna have a carbohydrate surplus of 28 grams. But over the couple of days previous to today and the next four days, it's gonna average a positive eight, we'll say it's basically positive 10. But this is the first day of the window 
of 10 to 13 millimeter thinning. So we are right now today at 202 degree days, and we like to hit the window between 200 and 250. Now you see here in the next to the last column, this window will go all the way until May 27th. Maybe we could say even May 28th. <clears throat> um, and so we could pick any one of these days that we think is the best and probably get really good thinning. But I wanna go back to the first column and show you that over those five days, there's not a single day that gets up into the 80s. There is one day where the nighttime temperature gets up to 62, and that's always something we look for anytime nighttime temperatures are above 62. And on that particular day, if you wait it all the way to May 27th, <clears throat> it's going to be a cloudy day, or at least that's a prediction. Half of the sunshine, and that's all going to give us a negative uh, carbon balance for that day. <clears throat> but so far, what we have based upon <clears throat> the carbon balance is a, a condition of relatively mild thinning. And so the carbohydrate model is suggesting, that's basically what I wrote it, told it to suggest, that we should use full rates and probably increase them by 30%. <clears throat> so luckily, and I thank Mike for this, Mike has measured fruitlets in Clifton Park and we have a first prediction of how much thinning we got from the, both the blossom thinning and the petal fall thinning. The top chart is Honeycrisp, and these measurements were taken yesterday, May 23rd. In these particular trees, they had the potential with all the clusters on it after pruning to have close to 600 total fruits, but the trees should only carry 65, 70 fruits. So that's our thinning job to go from close to 600 fruits down to 65 or 70 fruits. We need only 11% of all the fruits to stay on the tree. So the first two sprays, the blossom and the petal fall sprays have reduced the number of fruits on Honeycrisp from around 600 down to 181 fruits. That's great. We've accomplished most of the thinning. There's still a number of more fruits. We've got about a hundred extra fruits on those trees. And so now the trick will be to thin, but not over thin. Now, as the blue bar gets closer to the pink target, then people get more nervous about applying another thinning spray. I'm gonna leave that for a moment and talk about Honeycrisp in a minute, but let's look at Gala. It's kind of a more challenging situation. Here, the potential was for about 630 fruits. And those first two sprays have only, they haven't even taken off half of them. We want to get down to about 100 fruits per tree, but we still have about 400 fruits per tree. So we have about four times as many fruits on galas as we want. This is a case where we need some substantial thinning at this moment in time, which is the most sensitive and the best time to get substantial thinning. <clears throat> So these two varieties are quite different. Honeycrisp, we were quite successful, like getting most of the thinning done, but Gala, we've only accomplished less than half of the job. <clears throat> now I'd like to switch to talk about what are our options and some suggestions on particular combinations and rates for different varieties. There are four commonly used uh, strategies at this timing. One is just seven, but with some oil as a penetrant, and that works quite well. It's much more common in Pennsylvania than it is in New York, probably because I haven't emphasized it over the years. But the most common two strategies for New York are either NAA in seven or Maxell in seven, <clears throat> and that's mostly what we recommend. Now for growers who have been trying to eliminate carbaryl or seven, from their spray program to have a carbaryl free fruit to market in certain marketing programs. We've been very successful suggesting instead of the seven to use Maxell combined with NAA. And we've had good luck at getting good thinning. <clears throat> now, based on the data that uh, Mike showed or developed in that earlier slide showing that we still have a lot of thinning to do on Gala, and my overall experience with this variety, although I haven't seen an orchard in the Capital District this year, I'm assuming they're all just still too heavy with Gala. That calls for Maxell at the high rate, which is 64 ounces tree row volume dilute basis, 
and a pint of carbaryl per hundred. Honeycrisp, however, is already thinned quite well. And so there the option is to use NAA plus carbaryl at either two ounces per tree row volume dilute or three ounces per tree row volume dilute. Now, what goes into my thinking here is the fact <clears throat> that I don't want to over thin Honeycrisp. But unfortunately, I don't have any deficit this year to help. I've got predicted carbohydrate surplus. And because of that, I would opt more for the three ounce rate because it's not going to be really warm. If it were to go into the 80s, I would cut that back to the two ounce rate because we've already got most of the thinning done with Honeycrisp. Now for Macintosh, we've traditionally been very successful with a lower rate of NAA, just a two ounce rate with Carbaryl. And that's what I would suggest again. Now Empire, Spur Delicious and Fuji are uh, Maxell uh, compatible varieties. They do better with Maxell, particularly Spur Delicious and Fuji because if you put NAA on those, we tend to get pygmy fruit. Now, based upon what Mike said earlier, the one block of Empire that he looked at, it looked like it thinned well with the bloom and petal fall spray. And so if you have an Empire block that is already thinned down quite well, I would then cut back this suggested rate of 64 ounces to only 48 ounces. But with Spur Delicious and Fuji, I think you're going to need the 64 ounce rate of Maxell at tree roll volume dilute. I emphasize again, we're not expected to have hot temperatures in these four days today and the next three when we expect to put on the thinners. And so we're gonna need that full rate. <clears throat> I wanna review with this slide, <clears throat> just an important point about how we actually determine the amount of chemical we put in a sprayer. All the rates that I've listed pre on the previous slide or that we list in the Cornell recommends are rates based on tree row volume dilute sprays. Thus, the amount of chemical that you actually put in the spray tank has to be calculated from those rates. I'm going to go through two examples here. The NAA example of three ounces or seven and a half parts per million, as we used to talk about it, or the <clears throat> Maxell rate of 64 ounces, which we used to talk about in parts per million as 100 parts per million. The first step in determining how much chemical goes in the spray tank is to calculate the tree row volume for an orchard and then compare that with the amount of water we're spraying and calculate a concentration factor. So the concentration factor is just basically the ratio between the actual tree row volume and the volume you're going to spray. Let's use this example. So for many high density tall spindle orchards, when they're mature, the tree row volume calculates out to be about 200 gallons. If you want to spray 200 gallons, you'd fully apply a dilute spray, but nobody's carrying that much water anymore. Everybody's spraying half of that water or less. Let's just assume you're spraying 100 gallons. Then 200 divided by 100 gives you a concentration factor of two. Now I chose that because it's a simple round number. <clears throat> then the next step is to take the rates that I've suggested, which are based on the dilute spray and multiply it by the concentration factor. So let's use the example of the three ounces of NAA on a dilute basis. You multiply it by the concentration factor of two, that means six ounces of NAA in every 100 gallons of water. Now let's assume my sprayer is a 500 gallon sprayer, so I've got five of these 100 gallon units. So six times five gives me 30 ounces of NAA goes in the sprayer. The Maxell example <clears throat> is similar. Suppose we want 64 ounces, which is half of a gallon, but the concentration factor is two because we're only spraying half the water. That means 64 times two is 128 ounces. That's a full gallon of Maxell in every 100 gallons in the sprayer. My sprayer is 500 gallons, so I got five units. So that's essentially five gallons of Maxell on a spray tank. <clears throat> so I just want to emphasize that if you really want to get results with thinning on hard to thin varieties, remember that you first have to calculate the concentration factor and then use the rates that I've suggested multiplied by that concentration factor for every 100 gallons in your sprayer. And if you have a 500 gallon sprayer, that's multiplied by five or a 400 gallon sprayer, it's multiplied by four. Now, one last comment. <clears throat> I generally don't use that concentration factor for the amount of carbaryl or seven that goes into the tank or any surfactants that would be applied. That's because carbaryl 
or 7XLR or 74L, whatever version of 7, has a limited solubility in water. And so the first pint per 100 is about all that's in solution. And when it's sprayed out, only the amount that's in solution could be absorbed by the leaf. If you add more carbaryl per 100, say you put two pints, which is very common, or you use a concentration factor, which would give you two pints, that second pint per 100 is just in suspension and it's mixed by the sprayer and sprayed out, but it's not in solution. And therefore it just sits on the leaf and it serves as an insecticide. <clears throat> if however, you get some dews and light rains to re-wet this, you can get more of that seven taken into the plant because it'll last about 10 days on the leaf. And then sometimes you get more thinning than what you expected because more seven is taken in. So, so I prefer not to have that extra seven sitting on the leaf and just put the one pint per hundred of seven. <clears throat> now, a couple of suggestions for you. <clears throat> I wanna repeat that based upon bloom date of May 11th and the temperatures we've had, the best timing for this 10 to 13 millimeter spray is either starting today, you could go out after the meeting and start spraying through Friday possibly even through Saturday. All the days are gonna be quite similar. They're all gonna have relatively moderate temperatures somewhere around 75, but unfortunately a carbohydrate balance that's positive, around 10 grams positive. This is predicted to give mild thinnings. Therefore, this calls for the use of full rates. Now, those of you that have, well, we've all been through heat already this year and it scared us in some cases. In the Hudson Valley, they were supposed to be spraying these 12 millimeter sprays last Saturday and Sunday and the heat just scared everybody to death. <clears throat> so they waited, but we're not looking at that anymore. We're looking at more modest temperatures. And so it will require full rates. This is a year when we have mid seventies that Max Hell will do a great job in uh, these, at least it's not in the sixties. So with Honeycrisp, We've already achieved really good thinning from bloom and petal fall sprays. And with a little more thinner now, will probably result in near perfect thinning. And there will be no additional rescue spray needed. However, with Gala, because there's no real deficit to help us, this spray will probably not finish the job. We'll still have too many Galas that you'll either hand thin or you'll be coming back uh, in a week for another round of uh, Max Allen 7 and oil. <clears throat> I wanna encourage you to run the carbohydrate model right before you spray, because what I just showed you earlier in this presentation, a lot of what's gonna to happen tomorrow, the next day, the next day is forecasted and the forecasts often change. But if you run the model right before you spray, you'll have the most up-to-date information. And this model is available either on the internet at nua.cornell.edu, or at this site that we've created called malusim.org, which is you can look at on a desktop sort of format, or you can download the Malusim app to your phone and run it on your phone. I don't expect that we're gonna have serious carbohydrate deficits this year, but I put out this warning because it did turn out in Hudson Valley, we ended up in this situation. <clears throat> if we get minus 60s, don't spray, wait it out wait till after that's passed. <clears throat> I remind you that at this time, at the 10 to 13 millimeters, all thinners, either the Maxell, NAA, Carbaryl, have their strongest effect. And because of that, it's wonderful that we can get the thinning done, but it also carries some risk. I think this year there's little risk of over thinning because of the carbohydrate surplus. <clears throat> so the carbohydrate model is very useful because it guides us and this year it's guiding us to full rates. <clears throat> but it will be important to assess, especially with Gala, probably not so much with Honeycrisp because we're already close, but to assess with Gala how well thinning at the 10 to 12 millimeter stage worked. And the only way to really know that in time to come back a week from now with another spray is to measure fruitlet diameters and run the fruit growth rate model. This is the way we suggest you do it, 15 spurs on five trees, measure it 50 days, no, 50 degree days after you spray. And you can get that number off of the carbohydrate model, that column with degree days. 
and then remeasure about 100 degree days after application. Use the phone app or the malusim.org uh, uh, fruit growth rate model. It's really easy to use, but I want you to use that either on the phone or at the malusim.org website because we've included in that version error detection protocols that help prevent wrong answers, which has been a concern that I've had for many years when the numbers might be entered wrong. <clears throat> So with that, I want to stop and thank you for your attention. Hopefully I've answered some, most of your questions, but I hope also that it's uh, given you confidence to go forward in the next two to three days, four days and do your main thinning. All right, thank you, Terrence. I'll go ahead and open it up to questions, both <clears throat> in person and virtually, if anybody has any. Terrence, what do we do if we have uh, larger trees, tree row volumes that are 300 gallons a acre? We're not all we're not all modern like like they are down in the valley or out in Lane County. I recognize Jay Matthews' voice. Was that Jay? Yes. Oh, <laughs> Great question, Jay. And so what I end up doing is I put a limit of 200 gallons. So even if the trees are big and they're really 300 gallon trees for thinning. I tend to prefer just to say they're 200 gallon trees. So the maximum concentration factor that I use is two. I use a lower number, for example, on younger blocks, they might only measure 150 gallons or they might only be 120 gallons. And then the concentration factor might be 1.2 or 1.5. But I would suggest you use a maximum tree row volume of 200 for this calculation for two reasons. <clears throat> One is that the big trees have a lot more foliage inside the canopy that's more easily thinned. And they're secondly, they're generally on more vigorous rootstocks, which are easier to thin than on M9 or the dwarf Geneva stocks. So for those two reasons, I don't want to use a concentration factor of three. Does that make sense, Jay? Yes. Okay. And what about uh, what about treetops? I know usually you talk about putting more of your material towards the tops of the trees. <laughs> I forgot that slide. I, dang it! Now I'm kicking myself. <clears throat> That's one of my important suggestions. So we almost always, probably every time I've ever measured this, we overthin the bottoms compared to the, the top. So for the earlier sprays at bloom, I want you know a uniform pattern with the lower nozzles being the same as the upper nozzles with all nozzles on. But when we get to this stage, traditionally we have said, let's re-nozzle the sprayer so that only one third of the spray comes out in the bottom half of the nozzle bank and two thirds comes out in the upper part of the nozzle bank. That's still a good suggestion, but we did these four years of studies, two before I left on my leave and Pollyanna did too, which showed even then we're still over thinning the bottoms. So we've modified our suggestion for this moment, the 10 to 13 millimeters to nozzle if you can, so that only 25% of the spray comes out in the bottom half of the nozzle bank and 75% comes out in the top. Generally what happens is the part that's going to the upper part of the tree falls into the lower part of the, some of it falls into the lower part of the tree or in the next row on the lower part of the tree. So we still get great thinning because the lower part of the tree has more shade and thins easier. So I wish I had put that in my slide, but that's maybe Mike can uh, in, emphasize that in what he writes up. 75% in the top, only 25% in the bottom. Yep, can definitely do that. Any other questions? Well, Terrence, I was wondering if you could clarify for the that, that minus 60 deficit, is that a one day deficit or is that a seven day <clears throat> weighted average deficit? Uh, that's a great question, Mike. And I wish I could uh, have written this out better, but it turns out that it's really a two to three day minus 60. And this comes from studies that Alan Laxo and I did where we would impose that kind of deficit through shading. A single day of minus 60 does not drop fruit. The tree has the ability to withstand one day. Well, when you piece together two or three days of minus 60, you're dropping fruit naturally. And then you put a thinner on top of it is when you way over thin. 
that's kind of what we had in the Hudson Valley this year when we had uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday below minus 60. And so I told them, you just shouldn't thin right now because it's just too dangerous. That minus 60 for three days will give some natural thinning. And so it's best to wait it out before you apply your thinners. So the seven day average sometimes doesn't get to minus 60 with that situation. But that's what I need to clarify in writing or put it in the website that if you get three days of minus 60, it's dangerous. And I think that the model, the carbohydrate model is one of its greatest values is to prevent over thinning. Help us avoid those times when it's just going to turn out bad. All right, great. Thank you for that clarification, Terrence. <clears throat> All right, any, anything else? What about recommendations for some of the more modern varieties, Terrence, like Snapdragon, Ruby Frost, Evercrisp, Pink Ladies? Okay, I'll walk through those four. Let me start with Snapdragon. Snapdragon's turned out to be a hard to thin variety, not as hard as Gala. Our best luck has been with Maxell 7 programs the 64 ounce rate. Now that's the case once you get past year four. Year three, which is the first cropping year for that variety and year four sometimes are a little tricky, but particularly year three, they're still young and they respond to thinners more aggressively. So for the young trees, if you're planted Snapdragon, I would suggest the more moderate rate of 48 ounces of Maxell and a pint of Carbro. But if they're five years or older, they need a full rate of Maxell, which is 64 ounces per hundred. Now, sadly, and this is one of my pet peeves, almost none of those orchards measure 200 gallons. I yet to see a Snapdragon orchard that measures more than 150. So you're really not gonna be concentrating it to a full gallon to the acre on Snapdragon. You might have a gallon or a half a gallon or three quarters of a gallon to the acre on Snapdragon just because they don't fill the space. Okay, moving on then, uh, Ruby Frost. So Ruby Frost, we can thin much, much easier. I like an NAA7 program on Ruby Frost, kind of like Mac at two ounces plus carbaryl. Um, what was the other varieties you said? Pink Lady, uh, Evercrisp. Okay, Evercrisp. I haven't figured Evercrisp out. It seems to be not setting as heavily in many places as we would like, and then often is thin too much and too light of a crop. So that one is one that I'm a little gun shy on. I tend to prefer a Maxell program because it's a daughter of Fuji and Honeycrisp, but a low rate of Maxell, the 48 ounce of Maxell plus Carbaryl. <clears throat> With Pink Lady, it's a very easy to thin variety. And so just two ounces of NA and Carbril or one ounce of NA and Carbril often does a really nice job at the 10 millimeter stage. I like to put something on a petal fall on Pink Lady to get part of the job done, then I can use a low rate now. All right. Any, any last questions? All right. Well, thank you so much, Terrence. I'm going to continue on with some little pest management updates, but uh, thank you for, for joining us today, Terrence. We appreciate it as always. Well, you're welcome. I'm going to sign off, but I uh, wish you the best of luck in this thinning this year. All right. Thanks, Terrence. So on the, the handout that I gave you all, you'll see on that first page, I, I put in the printout of the carbohydrate model that Terrence was talking about that we just walked through. And as he mentioned, it's important to say that each day it takes new averages. And of course, it's only as good as the weather forecast. So take that with a grain of salt. My big recommendation is check it the morning before you start mixing up your tank. Because if you do it the night before, by the morning, it's probably going to change. We've seen that happen a couple of times for us, so uh, that would be my main recommendation. And if you ever have any questions about how to interpret that a, a bit more than what Terrence walked through, feel free to give me a call. I'd be happy to walk you through it if you're interested in that. 
So then I just wanted to talk a little bit about some different pest management things that, that I've been seeing and thought we'd, we'd cover while we're in person here today. So apple scab, I've been pretty much following the Clifton Park weather station and the Voorheesville ones. Uh, if there's other ones that you prefer to use, please let me know. I'll add that to my rotation and can check them for you as well. And I probably just also ask you for your local biofix dates for various inputs, whether it be a green tip or a full bloom, that would help me key in on, on those different timings for you. But generally speaking, I looked at the new uh, apple scab model yesterday afternoon, and for the Clifton Park station and the Voorheesville station, it's showing that at this point, they're predicting that pretty much all the ascospores have discharged at this point, which tells us that we're pretty much getting to the tail end of primary scab season. That being said, we generally recommend keeping up your scab sprays for at least another two weeks, just because the model's imperfect. We wanna make sure that nothing's slipping through the cracks if you do have another infection event. For fire blight, now that blossoms are off the tree, we're, we're getting through the blossom blight stage. There are a couple of blocks that were just newly planted that still have a couple blooms out. So keep an eye on your fire blight model until those blossoms are off. If they're still bloom out, we're still susceptible. Luckily things cooled down the past couple of days, but now that we're starting to get into the, the 70s again, going into the weekend, you know, it doesn't take a lot of moisture for, for fire blight to get into the, the blossoms. So if you do have any blocks, that'll still be in bloom at that point. If there is rain coming, you know, it wouldn't hurt to, to get covered up with strep on them or a, another material of your choice ahead of that, that rain event. The other thing I want to mention too, is even though we're gonna be out a blossom blight season, shoot blight is definitely still gonna be a concern. If you have any hail, that's, that's really the time where you would wanna be using strep at that point. We don't like to use strep in the summer for any other purposes. Um, if you do find that you have some strikes from blossom blight during the summer, generally we would recommend, if you get it on early enough, you can use an Apogee program. The sooner you get that on the better, because once you start getting further out and you get close to the terminal bud set, you know, you're not really stopping it at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but if you find it early and you still got some shoot growth coming, you can use Apogee just to slow things down, slow down that fire blight. And then what would normally be recommended is um, pruning it out and then covering up with, we like a, a Cueva double nickel program just to protect the new shoots. Anything that's already infected, of course, you can't do much, but it's just to protect the, the new tissue that hasn't yet been infected. We do have some funding this year again to do some fire blight resistance testing. So if you've been hammering strep and you find that you, you're still getting shoot blight and you're concerned, even if you're not that concerned, if you do find strikes, I'd be happy to come collect it and send it off to the lab because we're really interested from a research side of things is what are the different strains of, of fire blight that are out there? And then are the, the resistant strains? And there are some pockets in Wayne County and we actually did test in Clinton County and we found one block that looks like it had strep resistance. We, might, we think that might've been a fluke, uh, but we're gonna follow up on that this year just to, to double check. Cause obviously we don't wanna lose that tool and it's easy to build resistance to strep. So uh, we wanna keep an eye on that. So if you do see strikes, feel free to give me a call. I'd be happy to come collect it for you and send it off to the lab. Blister spot, I did wanna talk about that just cause it's, it's fairly timely. That's another bacterial disease. And um, I don't think we see it that often in our area, but I know some orchards in Albany County, they'll see it on their snapdragons every now and then. It just causes this, this little blistering in the lenticels. And it's, it's, it's not really a huge issue. It's more of a cosmetic, but for, for those orchards that are going more of the wholesale market, it can be a, a problem. So our, our main recommendation for that one is actually one of the phosphoric acid products. And that time is usually 10 to 14 days after petal fall. And if you're much later than that, you really see a diminished return on, on that spray. So if you do have that, that would be the time to get that out for it. Powdery mildew. I think we had a pretty cold winter, so I'm expecting to see less of it overall this season, but still, if we have these, these warm, dry spells, that's, that's really good mildew timings. Usually that's because we're, we're able to kind of lax the scab program a little bit more. But if you do have areas where you do have mildew year after year, particularly on your more susceptible varieties, up north, Punny, Crisp, and Cortlands are really the, our poster childs for it. If I'm gonna find it, it's in those blocks. Uh, you know, keeping good mildew materials in the rotation. Once you get past petal fall, Carrick would recommend 
on a roughly 12 to 14 day basis when you're doing your covers, you know, putting something in that's going to be good for mildew until you hit terminal bud set just to keep that secondary infection from spreading on you. Bitter rot, I did want to talk about that too. We're not quite at that timing yet. Generally, that's going to be coming up when we get into mid to late June is when we, we really want to start thinking about that one. But I know last year, with the amount of rain that you guys got in July, 10 inches plus in, in some areas, you know, it was hard to get out and just keep things covered. Um, so I think it's, it's prudent to be on top of it in case there is a lot of inoculum for bitter rot this season. Um, so Captans is a good product for it, but you should also probably be mixing in some stronger materials as well. I've listed a couple of ones that are, are rated pretty strongly for bitter rot. And these came out of Carrie Peters program down at Penn State where they've got it a bit warmer. So they've got a lot of bitter rot pressure. So some of their recommendations, a lot of the single site materials like Aprovia, Flint Extra, Luna Sensation, Marivon, Fontellis, and then also Omega, which is a, a frac group 29. So mixing some of these into the mix with your captain covers should help keep bitter rot under control. So thinking more about those summer diseases, I also wanted to just talk about sooty blotch and fly spec. We do have a new model to predict when you're gonna be seeing increased susceptibility to that one. Generally, that's gonna be based on the amount of leaf wetness hours that you get following petal fall. And I ran that model yesterday for the Clifton Park station. We're still low at this point and it looks like we're gonna stay pretty low. If things keep staying on the drier side, it'll be a little while before we really have to start thinking about our good materials for sooty blotch and fly speck. Plum Curculio, switching over to insects now. The new model for that, we like to manage that out through 308 degree days, base 50 past our petal fall. Whenever that occurs 10 to 14 days within our most recent Plum Curculio application. So you go out and spray and then say you hit 308 degree days four days later, you should be good for the season for Plum Curculio. The problem is if you get your spray out and then 14 days later, you're only 270 degree days, you could still get some damage after that. So that's how we like to determine how many times you need to go out for Plum Curculio. You know, generally we'd say it's, it's gonna be two to three applications. In a cooler year, like this might be shaping up to be, it could be longer. We also recommend keeping an eye on your insect traps or you know, having your, your consultant be, be checking them for you. Keeping an eye on that, we had our first OFM capture in Saratoga County back on May 5th, and our first collie moth came on May 20th. Yep. Oriental fruit moth. Oh. Yep. Yep. So with that, I entered that into the Clifton Park weather station just to see what the model was saying as of yesterday. So you can see I put the degree day since the first catch for OFM. As of yesterday, we were at 352. And I won't read through this for you, but basically it's saying your petal fall spray should have picked up your OFM. And then generally your first cover 10 to 14 days later should pick up any that are hatching on the later side. And that should also pick up your early hatching codling moth. And then speaking of codling moth, we looked at the output for that yesterday as well. We were at 74 degree days and you can see what new was saying for that. It says for anything that is targeting the early egg laying period. So any of those oviside materials, those go out at 50 to 75 degree days. So we're right about at the tail end of that window for the Clifton Park region. And then your more classic codling moth materials, the larvicide materials, they're gonna go out about 100 to 200 degree days. So we're gonna be getting into that within the next few days. Uh, that's really gonna be picking, picking them up in your first cover. And then you can continue using that model throughout the rest of the season to see when your subsequent summer spray should go on as well. Uh, just a quick note, I know up north, we've had some issues with San Jose scale and woolly apple aphids in a couple blocks the past couple of years. It seems like woolly apple aphids have really been picking up in our area for the last two years or so. So I thought uh, just to put in now, since the timing is about right, Mavento generally, We'll do a good job on both of these pests, but we want to get the timing on early, generally at this petal fall, the first cover timing. So even though we're not really seeing crawlers or nymphs at this point, because it's a systemic material, 
It needs to get taken up into the foliage and then move throughout the tree. That's why we need to get this on ahead of time. So even though you don't really know if they're present yet, I think of those blocks where you have a history of it being an issue, I could think of a couple up by me where they are. I think Mavento at this time, it would be a nice, a nice option. And then of course you got plenty of other options when you actually do start to see the crawlers out. So we have that all in the Cornell guidelines. You can see what materials you would want to use at that point. I don't think we have any cherry growers here today, but for the recording's sake, I will talk about this. We are trialing out a, another new newer model that is available from MSU. They put this together for tart cherries, but we think it could work for sweet cherry growers as well. The idea there is you record your full bloom date, and then it uses the degree days to determine when your fruit's gonna be at the right maturity stage for it to actually be susceptible to spotted wing drosophila. So if you do have cherries and you like to try this out, just send me your full bloom date or your, your best estimation. And I'll pop that into the model and, and keep an eye on that. And we can help you determine when your, your fruit are gonna be at risk. And we're also having our, our trapping network throughout the region. Our technician, Natasha, she's trapping for SWD and a couple different crops and a couple different farms throughout Saratoga County. So we'll also be posting those alerts when we start to actually see them. So we'll have when they're out, when the crop's susceptible and hopefully key in on those management decisions this season. Uh, last thing I put on here, for anybody that's looking to replace an orchard block, if you're, you're taking trees out and, and plan to replant in the next, next year, uh, please get in touch with me. I'm interested in doing a demo trial with a two-year orchard replant cover crop strategy. So that's based around some work that I did back when I was at Penn State. We were using Sudan grass and rapeseed in a two-year cover crop strategy. And the idea there was it was nice for replant because it'll deal with a lot of the nematodes and the diseases that cause replant issues. Then it also gives us time to adjust the fertility and make some other adjustments to the soil. So uh, it'd be nice to, to trial that in our conditions. Our trial sites were down in South Central Pennsylvania and, and Adams County, so they have a longer growing season. So I'd like to see what it looks like for us. And I'd like to see if it actually does any positive benefits for our soil quality over that two year period. It's not a ton of time. Uh, generally with soil health, we, we see long-term changes, but um, if you're interested and you wanna plant some, some sorghum Sudan grass mixes, get in touch with me and, and we'll talk. Um, and then speaking of soil health and kind of transitioning to weed management, uh, just driving around, at least up in my neck of the woods, Weeds that really have taken off in the last two weeks uh, with that heat that we had, things really just, just started to grow. I think we got six inches of new weed growth over the weekend, that past weekend. Um, and of course, with us thinking about thinning and all of that, yeah, it's, it's kind of on the back burner, but keep an eye on that. A lot of the contact materials that we're generally using, the label will tell you, you know, get it on before the weeds are four to six inches high. And at this point, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of past that window for a lot of those materials. So things like Ramoxone, Rely, you know, a lot of the labels will tell you for best control, you want to get them on early. As far as the systemic materials, you know, I, don't, I don't know where everybody's comfort level is with those, but they are certainly a, a good toolbox for us. Um, you know, things like the different 2,4-D products, glyphosate, they have their time and place. And when we talk about perennial weeds, I'm not really sure what else we have to, to really do the job on them. Yeah. I mean, with the, the contacts, I kind of think of it as like kind of mowing them, you know, you'll, you'll kind of cut the top growth off, but then they'll, they'll kick right back like mowing the lawn. So, yeah. um, but with those materials, we want to be using them carefully and to really get the best control out of them. Timing is, is essential with them. Weather's essential with them. So really targeting the best weather before they're stressed out but also not getting it on too early before they fully expanded. And because with them, we really need to translocate that product down into the root systems. So really focusing for your, your really problem weeds, making sure you're getting them on at that right growth stage. Um, the labels will, will tell you, you know, for this weed, get it on between rosette to bud stage. And I think really keying in on that is, is really your best bet. I know thistle up by me right now, both Canada thistle, we also have perennial south thistle, that's, that's really nasty stuff. We're starting to see some rosettes. I think we're still a little on the early side for that, but 
you know, pay, paying attention to those perennial weeds and, and getting those timings right, I think will really pay dividends. So mm -hmm. some things to keep in mind. So that's all I've got on the, the IPM side of things. Any questions or Jay, would you like to add anything? Not to put you on the spot? No, nope. very thorough. I know you talk about thistle. The only thing I would tell you there is we can't control thistle unless we control it in rural middles. Yeah. We can keep killing it out underneath the trees, but until we spray our middles, we're not gonna get out of thistle. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, so things to keep in mind, Stinger, I don't have a ton of experience with it. But our new weed scientist, Lynn Sosnowski, she says it does a really nice job on thistle. Again, timing's everything, but but she likes that material. To your point though, you gotta do something about the row middles because it's just gonna keep creeping back because it's it's got that root system. So it's gonna move right back in. And again, I don't have a ton of experience with it, but I know a grower, I won't name names, but he's uh, he had some some different broadleaf issues. I'm sure thistle was was probably one of them. And what he does is he'll treat the entire row, row middle, tree to tree, and he'll do a fall application of 2,4-D and he swears by it. He does that in his stone fruit. And the reason he got into it was actually because he had a lot of tarnished plant bug issue. And so what he found was, you know, they're attracted to the broadleaves. So he, he does the 2,4-D once every three, four years in the fall. Cleanest row middles I've ever seen. I've, I've seen pictures of it. And he says he doesn't have tarnished plant bug problems anymore because there, there just aren't enough broadleaves in his orchards anymore to, for them to be on. So I think that's another good option too. If you're able to adjust your equipment right, it's, you know, it, it takes some fine tuning the sprayer to get it across the entire orchard row. But I think that could be another good option and that would be done post harvest in the fall. And of course you gotta have a good application window before things start to freeze up so that the weeds are still gonna be susceptible to it. But if you can find the, the window, I think that could be another nice strategy. As far as I, I know of. Yeah, I don't think there's any restrictions on 2,4-D. It might be encapsulated in 2,4-D or the encapsulated dicamba you're talking about for soybeans, which is uh, different. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Long Island's its own with, with their sandy soil. That's a whole different ball game. I see a lot of herbicides that are not allowed down there. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm just going to see. I see Kevin and Kenny are still on here. I'm not sure if, if either of you have any questions on any of that before we sign off. They might have walked away at this point. <laughs> I think we are set. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this then. All right, thank you guys for, for attending today and we'll catch you again. If we have a rescue thinning meeting, I'll, I'll get an announcement out, hopefully not too last minute. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there and good luck.